so good a care of us. You, uh, you paid such a great price to buy us for yourself. And, uh, and you just love us more than we can possibly imagine. So, Father, would you please uh, come join us tonight. You be our teacher. Come speak to our hearts. And, uh, God, may you uh, just be our central focus tonight. You be uplifted and glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Well, that was pretty bad. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, much better. <clears throat> well, we are in Judges. As last week, we finished uh, the book of Joshua. And I need my glasses. That would help. So... Usually I'm not up here. Uh, usually after I finish a book, uh, Mike Williams comes up here, but I arm wrestled him and I won. So, <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, we switched because uh, I have uh, something to do in a few weeks and Mike volunteered to switch with me. So um, we will start off the book of Judges. Um, I want to say a couple of things in regards to what uh, Scott had said about the announcements. Um, the uh, Valentine's is the 14th, so it was, I think that was three weeks ago this past Monday. Not 100% sure, but if you haven't bought your ticket, uh, would you please do so as soon as you can? Reason being is we need to know how much food we need to buy. Uh, also, I ordered all the uh, tablecloths and stuff for uh, the tables uh, for here in the sanctuary and stuff like that. So uh, if you can remember, uh, buy your tickets either today, because if you need a ticket today and you have the money, uh, I'll meet you out there after and we can get your ticket. If not, uh, plan on trying to do it on Sunday. This way we can remember, or we can, we can know how many, uh, how many dinners we're serving. So um, we will more than likely have child care if that uh, has been a sticking point, but uh, it should be a lot of fun. All the ones in the past have been, and uh, we have a really good guest speaker, and um, he's actually a local guy um, and, a, and a good pastor. He's got a really, really good heart. Um, so you'll, you will definitely enjoy him. Um, and hopefully, because I asked both him and his wife to speak, uh, hopefully she will as well. She's, she's actually better than him, but you know how that goes. So anyway, uh, the book of Judges, kind of interesting book. We had a lot of uh, blessings in the book of Joshua uh, they entered into the promised land, they, they occupied, occupied the land, they divided up the land, and uh, it, it, was, it was a real blessing for the nation. They followed God, they were obedient to God. Yeah, they made mistakes, uh, but, uh, you know, God dealt with them, they dealt with it, and they were overall very obedient, and so God blessed them and continued to bless them. And then we get to the book of Judges, and it's kind of an interesting book. Uh, it's, it's called Judges, and, and what it is, it's not really like uh, somebody that would judge, like a Judge Judy or something. Is she still around? Anyway, uh, it's, it's not like that, but what it is, uh, it's a, the judge would be the guy who would be going... Uh, in front of the people for the Lord. So it would be almost like the high priest. As we get into Judges, you're going to see the high priest isn't mentioned. Uh, and really the book of Judges is, should be called the book of failure because that's exactly what it was. Because they did what was right in their own mind. And you look around the world today, isn't that what we're doing? There is no right or wrong, right? But... You know, we're doing what's right in our own mind. So uh, it's, it's, you know, in, judge, in uh, Joshua, they trusted in the Lord. 
And in Judges, they're disobedient. They're idolatrous. Idolatrous. Okay, here we go. Idolatrous. I hope that's the word. Um, anyway, it, and over and over again, you're going to see this cycle that they go through. Uh, they're disobedient, and then they get occupied, and they're put in bondage, and then they cry out to the Lord, and then the Lord answers them, and he sends a judge, and the judge frees them from their bondage. Uh, and then it starts all over again. It's just really sad. And, but in the beginning, they cry out to the Lord each and every time. And as it goes on, it's less and less of them crying out to the Lord. So it's a, it's a cycle of sin to salvation, I guess you could say. But um, this book is really kind of interesting. It takes about 400 years give or take, but it's about 400 years long, uh, and the nation steadily gets colder and colder and colder towards God. So um, really what we're going to go over tonight uh, in chapters 1 and 2 is the intro to the book of Judges. That's what chapter 1 and 2 is, actually going to talk about the death of uh, Joshua again, and we left him back in chapter 24 of Joshua. Um, but when him and Eleazar, the high priest, had, had died. So <clears throat> let's pick up in verse 1, and it says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up, Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. Now, it's kind of interesting because it makes you wonder, how did they communicate with God so that he could tell them, hey, uh, it's Judah. Well, they had these two words that I don't pronounce very well, but I'm going to say them, and you'll get the point, the ermum and the thurman. And what, nobody knows what it is, so just like me, I have no idea. And it... Some people say, some scholars says it was like uh, lights and reflections, because that's what it means, but maybe a white rock and maybe a black rock. So the black would be no, and the white would be yes. So, hey, who do you want to go up? Reuben, and you'd get black. Or Simeon, no, you'd get black. And Judah, yeah, it's a white one. Okay, so that works out good. So that seems to be the way that they would uh, communicate with God. Uh, and they would ask him questions. Now, it's interesting because it says, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. Past tense, right? I had delivered the land. God has already done the work. It's time for Judah to walk through it, right? So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me and my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. Now, I don't know, you know, hey, Lord, you know, do you want me to go over here? And, and uh, you know, who do you want to go up here? Oh, well, you go up there, and I've already defeated him for you. Okay, that's great, Lord. Oh, Simeon, you want to come with me? It doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't know whether it was wrong. It really doesn't give any indication. But I would think if the Lord had told you to go over here and do this, and you believed him, why is he asking for fleshly help? If one man could chase a thousand, they had, I think at that time, there were six or 8,000 Canaanites in that land. So take seven guys. Let's go. But they asked Simeon if they wanted to go. So they did. Then verse 4, Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. Okay, so there was 10,000 at least. <clears throat> but So here the Lord delivers them, just like he said he would. God is faithful all the time. He said that they would defeat him. They did defeat him. He delivered them into their hands. Then Adonai Bezek fled 
And they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And that's it. Let's go home. No. Cut off his thumbs and big toes. Now, that's kind of interesting because, um, well, let me read the next verse first. And it says, And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. So this Adonai Bezek had killed 70 kings, or cut off their toes, their big toe, and their thumb. Now, why did they do that? Well, you can't wield a sword with no thumb, right? You can't shoot a bow and arrow without a thumb. If you don't have a big toe, you can't run very well. You're going to be unsteady because for some reason, the way God made it, that big toe, the captain, the king, he uh, balances us to the point where we can run. So he slowed him down, but he took 70 of these guys and they ate scraps from underneath his table. And it's interesting here that he says, as I have done, so God has repaid me. Now, he didn't say Jehovah, but he said, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem and he died. You know, it's a, it's a law and it works every time. What you sow, you shall reap. What an interesting picture, isn't it? Way back here in Joshua, Oh, yeah, well, God has repaid me for what I've done. I sowed big toes and thumbs, and so I reaped big toes and thumbs. Now, it's interesting how this kind of works out for this guy. But, you know, if you sow to the wind, you'll get the whirlwind, won't you? If you sow sin in your life, you're going to be just as wicked you're going to be it's going to be a difficult thing because if you sow sin and God says what you sow there you shall reap if you sow righteousness are you going to get righteousness back now it's also interesting as we look at this and if you sow an apple seed what do you get? Yeah. Grapefruit, right? No. Well, that's what the world says. You know, come on. It doesn't have to be after its kind, like God said. You know, we sowed some apple seed, and somebody brought in a whole bunch of grapefruit out there. They're sitting out there in the foyer for you to grab on your way home. If you want a grapefruit, they're pink, and I heard, I heard they're really good. They look good. <clears throat> if you sow wheat, you're going to get wheat. If you sow mercy, you're going to get mercy. So this man said that God repaid him, and he did. His, thumbs were, his thumb was cut off, and his big toe was cut off. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains in the south and in the lowlands. So they were up in the north. Now, if you remember back in Joshua, and I believe it was chapter 14, um, it said that they couldn't defeat Jerusalem. And here it says that they fought against Jerusalem and took it. Now, the historian uh, Josephus said that the, what they're speaking of here is that it was the northern part of Israel that they had taken. Because if you remember, uh, they did take bits and pieces of it, but later on, Benjamin is going to fight and Jerusalem is going to rebel and kick them out. And it doesn't get taken until who comes along? Anybody remember? King David. King David. Then Judah went against the Canaanites who dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba, and they killed Sheshai, Amen, and Talmia. Now those were sons of Anak, 
So they were giants. So they killed them. From there they went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kirjath Sefer. Then Caleb said, Whoever attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it, to him I will give my daughter Aksha as wife. Now this is we read this back in I don't know eleven or twelve uh, of uh, of uh, Joshua. Um, and, and he said, hey, whoever takes this land, you know, after Joshua went to get his land, because he wanted to fight the sons of Anak, that those were giants, he had to wait 38 and a half years to do it. But he here says, whoever attacks Kirjath Sefer, he's going to give his daughter to. Now this Aksha uh, as a wife, and that means adorned, okay? Adorned. Uh, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, so he gave him his daughter Aksha as wife. Now, uh, Othniel means lion of God. So lion of God is going to marry adorned. Now it happened... When she came to him, that she urged him or moved him to ask her father for a field, and she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, what do you wish? So obviously, uh, probably Caleb heard his daughter telling this guy, hey, go ask my dad for this, go ask my dad for that. So he said to him, give me a blessing since you have given me land in the south. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now this is a very interesting passage here. These few verses, you have this uh, adorned and you have the lion of God. And you get this picture of the lion of God defeating the enemy to what? To what? Take a bride. Hmm. Boy, that sounds familiar. Where'd we hear that from? Who is adorned. Who is adorned. That was her name. This bride was adorned. And that's us through the blood of Christ isn't it? Isn't it? And interesting, as the Father dips down and gives them living water. What an awesome picture this paints for us to see. We are the adorned, the lion of God defeating the enemy, sin, death on the cross, giving us living water, taking the adorned ones, the church, the perfect bride for Christ. Interesting, isn't it? I thought it was. Now the children of the Canaanite, Moses' father-in-law, this would be Jethro, way back in Exodus, uh, went up from the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. Now that's kind of interesting because uh, later on down, well, it's not that far away now, but uh, Gideon had to fight the sons of Jethro, the Canaanites. And here it says here that they dwelt among them. And Judah went with his brother Simeon, and they, atta- they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zephrath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormath. Also Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. Now, I know we're probably not going to remember, but when we get further along in Judges and all these uh, territories just jump out and put uh, Israel in bondage, 
all the ones that they've already taken. Now, you know, God promised them this land. God promised them that it would be divided up, that they, uh, that they would have an inheritance. He promised them a land of milk and honey. Did he give it to them? Yes. He did. But he also told them what? If you follow after their gods, if you don't utterly destroy their gods, those people will turn your heart away from me, and then they will put you in bondage. And this is exactly what's already happening. Not even a generation has passed. Now, those of you who are around my age remember, uh, you know, when we went to school, uh, we would, most of the time that I can remember, was a Bible verse was quoted. We would pray, and then we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance. And so it's been almost a generation that has went by, and look at what we have today. You know, and it wasn't uh, Darwinism that was taught. You were taught creationism as well. Now, pff, you can't even mention God. You can't even pray. I've heard where kids that bow their head over their lunch, and a teacher sees them or somebody complains. And not even a generation has passed, has it? Getting close to it, but not even a generation has passed. And look how far we've turned away from the Lord. And they're going to do the same thing. We're going to see that it, it's, it's just a short period of time. As soon as Joshua and the leaders died off, it was over. They turned their heart away from God and turned them to the, uh, to the idols and they worship their gods. And you, you, you see it. You see it in our country. It's a shame. It really is. Also, oh, I read that. <clears throat> Verse 19. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out, uh, drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. So they have a reason for they didn't do it. Now turn with me to Joshua chapter 11, if you would. And I want to pick up in verse 4. It says, so they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude with very many horses and chariots. Now, we've talked about this before. Chariots back in them days were like tanks. Uh, soldiers didn't do too well against tanks, and they didn't do too well against chariots. So here they are with, with as much multitude as the sand on the seashore, and they had many horses and tanks. And when, they, and when all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid because of them, for tomorrow, about this time, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Merom, and they attacked them. And the Lord delivered them. Who delivered the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook of Mizrapoth, and to the valley of Mizpah eastward. They attacked them until they left none of them remaining. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots their chariots with fire. So here we are, <laughs> just a short time later, Joshua's gone. They had just done this. This could be like 10 years 
uh, had gone and passed. And here they say, um, they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. They had lack of faith. They didn't trust the Lord. They didn't believe the Lord that he would do it. They saw with their eyes these chariots. And what did they do? They were fearful. They were afraid. And it's a good lesson for us. Are we afraid? Do we get scared sometimes? Oh, the Lord's not that big. He can't be that big. He can't do this. But we, when we take our eyes off the Lord... That's what we see, isn't it? We see the things around us. We see the obstacles. And when we have our eyes on the Lord, we see what He has done. He just, he just did this a short time ago. Now they're afraid because they had chariots of iron. They, they had lack of faith. Oh, the Lord can't do that. Well, he just told you he would do it. You've just been fighting these, uh, uh, these nations and knocking them off. Now you get here, all of a sudden they have a couple of chariots? Come on. Verse 20, And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak, Forty years he had waited, Caleb. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell in, with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And that's before Daniel. And that's pretty sad. They're supposed to kick them out. But here they are dwelling with them. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel. And the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly called Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, please show us the entrance to the city and we will show you mercy. So he showed them the entrance to the city and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, and call its name, take a guess, Luz. Luz, which is its name to this day. So here's a guy who had a goal in life, and that was to live in a city called Luz. This was his goal. This was his dream. He needed to live in a city called Luz. But see here, as we look at this, and the house of Joseph went up to Bethel, and the Lord was with them. What did they need to go to this man for? If he was part of the city, he was supposed to go. Verse 27. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo, Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. And it came to pass, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but not completely drive them out. We saw this before, didn't we? We saw this back in Joshua. They wouldn't drive them out completely. But they would put them to tribute. They would be forced labor, or they would collect the tax. But they weren't being obedient to what God had said. So here they are. They're compromising again. They put them under tribute instead of, dri instead of driving now. Now, I don't get it. If they're that strong to where they could put them under tribute, why didn't they just wipe them out? It doesn't add up. Why? Because it's their heart. Their heart isn't towards God. Their heart is turned towards the world. They don't want to be obedient to God, completely obedient to God. Oh, it's okay. And so what happens? 
And we're going to see it just over and over and over and over in the book of Judges. They're failures because their heart isn't right. And, and for us today, it's, it's a good lesson for us. Are we obedient to what the Lord says? Or are we going to suffer the consequence? Now, thankfully, by grace, we are saved. Not of works, nothing that we could do, not how good we are or how good we could get, but by his mercy and grace, we are saved. But there's always repercussions for our actions, isn't there? You go out and kill somebody, there's going to be repercussions. You're going to get the chair or whatever they give you nowadays, or maybe they don't anymore, but you're going to spend most of the rest of your life behind bars. You steal from somebody. Not in this country, but you steal from somebody, they chop your hand off. So now you only got one hand to carry the rest of the stuff that you steal. But it usually doesn't work out that way. There's not too many two, two-handedless people in other countries. It's usually one, and they learn their lesson. But see, here, again, God warned them, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. They're going to turn your heart away from me. And it's the same for us. If we, if we are playing around in sin... If we're, you know, walking the tightrope like Jacob did, you know, one foot in Egypt and one foot in the promised land. And God would say to him, no, turn and go home. And he'd go a little bit of a way and then he'd stop and then he'd build a well. And then God would have to send all these guys over there to, to take his well from him. So he'd have to move back towards the land. And it just happened over and over again. And if you're walking the tightrope right now, stop. Repent. Turn back to the Lord. Or your heart will turn away from him. And this is the example that we're getting. Remember, Romans and 1 Corinthians says that this, the Old Testament, was an example for us. The things that happened was an example. Are we too stubborn to listen, to learn from it? Are we just disobedient? Now we're all going to sin. There's nobody in here perfect. Well, the Holy Spirit's here. He's perfect. But So it turned their heart. Their sin turned their heart. And you know, and we've probably all gone through this, you know, where we struggle and we, we take our eyes off the Lord and we're wrapped up in our circumstances and we have no joy anymore. And, you know, next thing you know, we're doing things that we just don't do, that we used to do that God has paid the price for, that he's forgiven us for. And, and we do, and we get caught up in it. And next thing you know, it's months or weeks or months that have went by, and, and you're, you haven't opened your Bible, and you haven't prayed, and, and you're like lost. And I, most people I know that are Christians have been backslidden. And it's a sad thing, but... Thankfully, they've turned back to the Lord. And, and you know how easy that can happen. And we get involved in stuff that we shouldn't get involved in. So here they are, and it says here, they put them to tribute. Verse 31, nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of uh, Acho or the inhabitants of Sidon or Al uh, Abla, Akzib, boy, i got to make these up, Helva, Af. Aphic, Rehab. <clears throat> so the Ashtarites dwelt among them, the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Now here again, now they were never strong enough, obviously, to put them under tribute, but now you have these nations that are dwelling with them. So they put them to tribute, now you have some that are dwelling with them. Now they're living with you. They're going to turn their hearts from God. Verse 33, Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites. Canaanites, here again. Now they live among the Canaanites. 
the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Ann were put under tribute. So here, some of them were under tribute and some of them were dwelling with the Canaanites. It's, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. And the Amorites, they forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down into the valley. So they basically kicked them out. Remember we talked about a few weeks ago that Dan was down in the middle of the country, uh, close to the coast, and they got kicked up all the way into the mountains because they couldn't defeat the enemy. So instead of being obedient and calling out to the Lord and asking him, they ran away. They left. They were put under tribute or under bondage. Verse 35, And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Hares, in Agilon, and Shabim, yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute. It's now, does Agilon ring a bell? So Joshua's fighting, right? They come over the top of the mountain, they ran all that way, they ran 12 hours uphill, 4,500 feet. They get to the top, they fight with their enemy, they're heading downhill, they hit that plateau, and the Lord rains fire from heaven, hailstones, right? They go down to the bottom. They're chasing the enemy. And what does Joshua ask God? Make the sun stand still. That was at Agilon. That was at Agilon. God made the sun stand still for Joshua so that they could keep fighting and win. But they, now the Amorites are there and they can't kick them out. One of God's greatest miracles as he listened to a man and stopped the sun. And now, here at the same place, they can't kick out the Amorites. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Acre. Akrabim from Selah and upward. I don't know why that was put in there, but they're giving you a boundary. But it, it, you know, it starts with compromise, doesn't it? We're not as obedient or we're not being obedient. Next thing you know, God's greatest miracle, our salvation, not that it would ever be in jeopardy, but we're still doing the things we did before. Then the angel of the Lord. Now, it's the angel of the Lord, which is who? God. Which is Jesus Christ. Came from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. This is what he's saying. I brought you up. I led you out of Egypt, brought you to this land. I will never break my covenant. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Now, this is kind of interesting and kind of spooky at the same time. How would you like for the Lord to say, look, man, I hung on the cross for you, bled out, died for your sin. Look at what you're doing. Come on. That would be kind of interesting. Why are you not obeying my voice? I got so many things for you to do. <clears throat> Therefore, I also said I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. They're going to entrap you. That's what snare means. They're going to entrap you, which is exactly what 
happens. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of this place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. It, Bochim means weeping. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. Now, it's kind of interesting because the people, when they heard this, when they heard the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the same that spoke to Moses in the bush, the same that spoke and sat down and ate with Abraham, this same Jesus that died on the cross, the angel of the Lord, when they heard this, what did they do? Their response was they wept. They lifted up their voice. They cried out and wept. Sad, isn't it? Because I don't see any repentance there. They just wept. Kind of like Esau. Remember him? Brother of Jacob. Sold his birthright. Cried out and cried out because he lost his birthright. He wanted a blessing. And Jacob took it from him, stole it from him. Remember, he pretended to be him while he was out hunting. Went to his dad. His dad, Jacob, gave him the... Uh, or um, his dad, Isaac, gave him the, uh, the birthright. You remember that story? Extra reading. Look that up this week. But what did he do? It says in the New Testament, I believe it was an axe, and I believe it was uh, Stephen that said it, that although he, re he uh, wept, he wept because he lost, he lost his blessing, but he did not repent. There's a difference. You could be sorry. You know, everybody in prisons is sorry. Right? Even though they say they didn't do it. I didn't do it. Who, me? No, not me. That was some other guy. No. But they are sorry. They're sorry they got caught. Oh, how could I be so stupid? If I'd have just done this, I'd have never got caught. So you hear, you have the nation as they hear from Jesus spoke these words to the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept but wouldn't repent. Verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now, it's interesting that one word that should just jump out the page to us is uh, who had seen. So the ones that had seen the things that God had done in the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders, they saw the Lord do the great works which he had done. So... Those people serve the Lord. So now we have a generation pass. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him with the, within the border of his inheritance at Timnath, Heres, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north south of Mount Gaash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who, what? Did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. What a sad state of affair that it never got passed on. You know, I remember listening to Chuck Smith years and years ago, probably 30 years ago, and one of his things that he used to say all the time is that he was afraid of was that when he left, that Calvary Chapel would be divided and that they wouldn't stay to the Word of God. Go Google 
Calvary Chapel and look them up. It's changed. It is divided. You have like three different, uh, one is kind of small, but you have like three different sets of Calvary Chapel. You have the ones that are for a certain person, and you have ones that are not for that person, that want it to be the way that it used to be when Chuck was around, and then you have ones that rebelled from Chuck, and they've kind of formed their own little group. It happened. And it was just a few months, and it happened. I don't even know if it was that long. But it's sad. So, you know, it's interesting here these people pass away the other generation who did not know the Lord nor the work he had done. They were never taught it. They were never taught it. Instead of passing it on, ah. And it's so important that we try to pass this on to our kids and our grandkids. Or we're going to have another generation like we have now, and it's going to be really bad if the Lord tarries. So one generation is gone, and here they've already turned away from the Lord. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, this is really sad because what did they do? The first thing they did is they forsook the Lord because they were following after other gods. And then they followed the other gods. And then they bowed down to the other gods. And it provoked the Lord to anger. God will turn away from them. And he does. Until they call out for him. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of the plunderers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Whenever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity or evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. So here you have this nation, a very short period of time goes around, and now they're following other gods. They're bowing down to them. They're forsaking the Lord. And they're provoking him to anger. And God has pulled his hand away from Israel. Verse 16. This is an awesome word right here. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, God's grace. We were sinners deserving of death. Nevertheless, God's grace. What an awesome word. Here they are doing all these wicked things. Nevertheless, God's grace. The Lord raised up judges. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up Jesus Christ and hung him on the cross. And his blood was spilled. Nevertheless, God's grace. He raised up judges who delivered them from out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet, they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not 
do so. How sad. How sad for this nation. But what an example for us. We need to be careful. Let's look at our nation. We need to be praying for our nation. We need to be, we need to be praying, period. We have you know, people that are sick. We have some that are very sick. And we need to ask the Lord to rebuke that sickness so that they can be healed and rebuke the enemy that's going around to and fro in this nation. <clears throat> Verse 18, And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with, with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who were oppressed, who oppressed them and harassed them. Nevertheless, God's grace, even though they were disobedient, he sent them judges. Nevertheless, as we were dead in our sins, he sent Jesus Christ. Do we get the picture? Do we see the correlation between the two? We're nothing but sinners saved by grace, aren't we? We're that nevertheless there, aren't we? We're fit right into that nevertheless. We need that nevertheless. Verse 19, and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So here's the cycle that we're going to see throughout from chapter 3 onward. We're going to see this cycle. Uh, they, they worship other gods. They're in sin. The other, the other nations come and oppress them. Uh, they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord never the less is them. Then they're, they, he sends them a judge. The judge fights for them. They're back on top again. They're obedient for the moment. And they just do it again. And it says here that they did, did it worse. They behaved more corruptly. Verse 20, Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel, Israel or prove them whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore, or because of, the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. Now it's kind of interesting. Because as we look at this and we see this and the Lord leaves the nations standing there. He, he, he leaves these nations to prove them. You know, we live in a sinful society. God could get us out of here in a heartbeat. God could have said, you know what, let me save you and then I'll take you home. Boy, that would have been great, wouldn't it? But there's work to be done, and that's why we're here, is to do this work. And see, God is saying to them, look, if you just do what I told you, here's what's going to happen when you get to the land. If, if you do this, and this is what's going to happen. Why do you want it to be that way? Why do you want to go up to Ai without praying and asking for the Lord's help? The Lord said he'd drive them out. He says to them, I've driven them out from before you. He had done it. Why would you keep, not keep asking? Now, who would agree that those people were pretty dumb? Just a few of us. Or is it all of us? But we act the same way, don't we? Come on now. Who thinks we act the same way? See, I got more of those than the other one. We do, don't we? 
Oh, this flesh. This flesh. Now, I want to read you something out of Ezekiel uh, chapter 22 before we close. So if you turn there with me. Chapter 22, verse 30. Now I want you to close your eyes and listen. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it but I found no one now this is God speaking saying I sought for a man or a woman among them among us who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it but I found no one. Do we want to stand in the gap and make a wall? Stand before the Lord on behalf of this country, on behalf of this, this body, the body of Christ, not just the people that are in this building, but the church itself. Are we willing to stand? Are we willing to stand before the Lord on behalf of our families, our friends, our co-workers, our relatives, people in the body of Christ, people in your sphere, your neighbors? Are we willing to take that stand? Or are we going to go the way of Israel and follow after their gods and follow after their ways of life? And that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Because, you know, one man or one woman with God can do all things. I believe the scripture says that, right? One man. Is there a man or a woman willing to take a stand to build a wall on behalf of others? Is there? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to set aside our pride and our prejudices? Are we willing to set aside what feels good? If it, hey, you know what? If it feels good, just do it. Isn't that the way it goes? Are we willing to forsake the things of the world to stand up and be obedient to God? Are we willing to do it? Or are we just going to, in this country, continue to go through the motions? Because that's what we do. And let them strip us away of everything that God has given us. Just like the nation stripped Israel away from everything they had. It became not a land of milk and honey, but a land of horror. That's what it became. And are we willing to take a stand? Or do we want to be complacent, just kind of go through it? Oh, yeah, I'm okay. I know I'm saved. Nobody can, nobody can take that away. Nobody could take that away. We're in God's hand, and nobody's getting us out of them. But are we willing to take a stand? Would God say today, in this body, in his church, I sought for a man or a woman among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it but I found no one. Would he say that? Are we praying for people in this body? 
You know, on Sundays and Wednesdays, we ask people to come up here and pray and don't have very good attendance. Nobody wants to pray. Oh, I'm okay, I'm good. Well, how about everybody else? Are we that selfish? Come on. I'm putting you on the spot here. You know that. But think about it. You know, we get up in the morning. Is our heart towards God? Or is it, I got to run out the door and go to work? Or I got to get up and take care of the kids? Well, I'm sorry. Ask the Lord to require you to use less sleep and get up an hour early. He'll do it. I used to whine to him all the time. I don't have enough time. Every time I get up, you know, and I try to read my Bible, and the kids are coming, and my wife wants me to do this, and it's like, you know, I might as well just go to work. At least I'm making money doing it, right? Boy, was that stupid. So I said, okay, Lord, you know, you want me to get up early? Wake me up, but I don't want to run through the day all tired. See, I'm just complaining, you know. I have that gift. And he changed it. Now I require less sleep and more time to be up. And it works. If you ask him, don't be like Israel. Hey, Lord, how do I defeat this? I need more sleep, and you want me to read your word. So you figure it out. Okay, I'll take your sleep away from you. No problem. Huh? Or we could be like Israel and just kind of go out on our own, and we know where that gets us, right? Nowhere. So are we going to stand? Are we going to stand in a gap? Are we going to stand in a gap for the body of believers, our family, our friends, co-workers, our country? Because God couldn't find anyone here is he going to find anyone here with it amongst us? Well, why don't we do this? Let's stand up and pray. Actually finished two minutes early. I just want you to know that. So, you know, you don't always say he never finishes on time, so now you can't say that because I was two minutes early. How about that? <clears throat> I'm usually ten minutes late, but anyway. So are we willing to take a stand? Do we understand what God is asking us to do? What he's showing us? Do we understand the pictures that God gives us? The picture of this guy and the daughter of Caleb the picture of a nation that turns its heart away from God. And look at what happens to them. And we all know the story. And he's asking, are we willing to take a stand? Are we willing to do what's right? Are we willing to ask him? Well, Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. Father, you give us a lot to chew on, a lot to think about, which is normal as we go through your word, Lord. You always give us those things, and we see these pictures that you, that you give the, to us, and we see how you sent your son to talk to them, and they, and they wept, but there was no repentance, and nothing changed. We see the story of Caleb's daughter, and what that meant it was by you we have living water father we see the stories of how one generation and all heck is break, breaking loose and they're going to turn away from you and lord we just pray that that not that not be in our heart but would be in our heart that we, we could say, Lord, I will stand for you. I will stand for those in this land. I will stand for my family and my friends and my coworkers in this nation and the people around the world. I will stand and I will pray. I will make a wall and stand. 
And Father, we just ask that you put that in our heart, Lord. That when we're not doing that, Lord, that you would prompt us to remember that we want to do this. And then, Lord, I ask that you give us the strength and that uh, we come alongside you as you do the work, Lord. Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy on us because we are just as wicked as what we read about tonight. But through your mercy and through your grace, Lord, we stand here clean, white as snow, our sins as far away as the east is from the west, in fellowship with you. Father, we love you and we praise you, and I ask that you bless each and every one of us here because we came to hear from you. Lord, we so miss the mark, and we're so grateful to you. We're so grateful for our salvation. Don't let anything come between us, Lord. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said, Amen. Amen.